Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. How many enjoyed the worship? Woo! Great job, worship team. So appreciate them and their uh, their commitment to us and leading us in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we're excited. What a great day. Uh, it was great having Shane here, but that is not the reason. That is not the reason for today. Actually, a couple months ago, I had texted uh, Vanessa and Shane both, and I said, hey, I really would like to see if Vanessa could come preach for us. And Shane was like, oh, but what about me? You know, he's all like, you know, all that stuff. You know, how, you know how he is. No. Uh, but no, you know, uh, but I figured, you know what? I, I want Vanessa to come and preach for us. We might as well give the big guy something to do. So we, we gave him something to do. So we let him play the keyboards and he's not half bad at it. Uh, so uh, but we appreciate it. But really, this is truly my heart. Um, many of us may you know Shane and Vanessa from their time with us, and over the last couple years, we've gotten to know them, and there is a call on Vanessa's life. There's a call to be a godly woman. There's a call to be a godly wife and a godly mother, but there's also a call in her life to, to deliver God's word in a, in a powerful way, and God has used her, and we just, we want to be a church, and we've told them we told them this long before they even committed to coming to Modesto, that Shelly and I were going to be a part of their lives and encourage them and, and to see what God has for them. And, and so this is just kind of a continuation of that. So I get a, this is just a treat. This is a blessing for me to see somebody who I love. And get all jacked up now. <laughs> somebody who I value um, and I esteem and... Uh, just to hear you and to be in the presence uh, of the Lord as you give his word and his truth is an honor. And it's an honor and it's a blessing. So would you welcome Vanessa Lapizzi to our church. It's just an honor to be here. 
And so thank you for having us. Yes. Yes. Well, little Lapisi family update for you. Our son, who was dedicated here um, to the Lord a little less than a year ago, turns one years old tomorrow. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so happy and sad at the same time. <laughs> Moms, you understand, right? It's like, oh, yeah. And I grow up. And they start talking, and they start talking back. And it's like, <laughs> we're so happy for him. He's learning to walk. Zoe is doing great. She's in kindergarten, doing well. She is, was asked to be in um, a little spot in the high school musical that they're doing there. And when we were here at this church, it was prophesied over her that she would um, be in the creative arts. And so we're seeing that unwind, and she's just fully walking into that. It's just so awesome to see. Zaylee, our, our second daughter, is starting pre she started preschool. She's doing great. She's mastering the art of, of going number two in the toilet. <laughs> it's tricky, guys. Sometimes it's a little, it's a little, some of us are still trying to figure that out. Okay? <laughs> Don't laugh too hard. You're going to give yourself away. <laughs> so thank you again for having us. Um, my husband took off, and, and he's pretty cool, you know? We like him. We'll keep him. Um, so we're just going to jump right into the word. Is that okay? Yes. How many of you are just hungry for the word of God? I just love it. I just love it. You just eat it up. Um, I, um, a while back, I spoke here about engaging on the Bible app. Um, many of you are my friends on the Bible app. And it's just the coolest place to like, just to, just to read the word of God and to do um, devotionals. And then what's really cool is that I can go in and see what everyone's read, and I can just get inspired by that word. It's just like a cool community of only the word of God, okay? Not fake news and <laughs> articles and memes and jokes and gripes. It's just a really cool community of just the word of God. So if you don't use the Bible app, I just encourage you. I don't work for them, okay? It's free, free little endorsement there, but it's just a really cool place, and, and it just helps um, you connect with your brothers and sisters in a very distinctive way. So we're just going to read today from Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 21, and this is a kind of a length, uh, a long length of scripture here, so just write it down, go back and read it on your own later, follow along with me as best you can, I might skip around just a little bit here. So we're going to start in verse 21. So the Lord caused, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife are both naked, but they felt no shame. And we're moving on right into chapter 3 here. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did you really say you must not eat from the fruit of any trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the, tr the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. They, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. God called out to man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent the serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, 
And from here on out, verse after verse, it's curses, curses, curses. You're going to grind the, 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 you're going to till the ground until you sweat. You're going to have pain and birth and child labor. You're going to this and this and this. He will rule and keep curses, 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 curses. Then down to verse 20, it says, Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. We all know the story, right? It's yeah. one of the um, basics. Christianity, Bible 101, we learn all about creation and, and the fall of man. And I love this story uh, specifically because I see most recently the parallels that happen in this story and are happening right now at the day that we're walking in right now. We're seeing in this, which should give us an actual clue of if what the enemy's plot was at the very beginning, his plot is continuing on generation after generation after genera generation. And so it just seems like as the years go by, he is just even more creative in his deception. And so we look at the original story and we're seeing that parallel in today. And so one of his greatest successes has been destroying the concept of identity. And he did it at the very beginning, and he's doing it today. And we can easily observe this in history, uh, the systematic destruction of all things defined specifically by God. There is an uprising against holiness, an uprising, more importantly, against finite truth. See, he is an infinite God that contains the finite truth. What he says goes. Yeah. It sounds weird to say that truth is limited by God because his limitations are none. But his word is the final word. It is the, it is the first word and the final word. Yeah. And there is a, a, an attack against the truth, against the absolute truth. What God has said shall be Man has spoken against it. We've seen men and fathers be emasculated and removed as heads and priests of their home. We laugh at TV shows and movies that make light of this situation, that undermine that God-given authority. We think it's funny. We must begin to ask ourselves in our world, men, where are you? Who are you? What has this world done to you? What have we done to you? We're seeing now an uprising of women who are who are who are demanding equality in, in their in their communities and workplaces and in combat and all while forsaking the tenderness and the distinctive femininity that was gifted to us by God, buying into the lie that that we're inferior to men just because uh, of our delicacies, not realizing that those are the things that are actually our strengths. He designed us perfectly to go together because when one is weak, the other is strong. When one is smart, the other is more, it, it, it needs the help, right? Not smart. <laughs> I wasn't looking at anyone. <laughs> one needs a little extra help, the other one can, you know, can buck up. And, and we see that kind of give and play take place. In, in the perfect design of marriage that God defined, right? Yeah. We see a little give, a little take on both sides every time. And it, I mean, if you're married, you understand this. Sometimes I'm just too tired, and he's just got a little more energy. Sometimes I just got a little more energy, and I thank you. Wow, oh, what a sweet touch. You guys are blessed here. Um, you see this, this, this give and take, and that was, why does it happen that way? Because it was God's original design. He designed it that way. He designed us to be helping to one another. And so we see this uprising of women. And I mean, call me old fashioned, but I don't want to be equal to a man, okay? Right. Okay, I don't like taking the trash out. Right. That was one thing we talked about in our vows. I will not take the trash out, okay? So he knew before he married me. I would do that. Um, you, you know, I, I, I like the door getting open for me. Yes, amen. <laughs> You know, and, and I'm sure that men, you may have some things that, you know, I don't want to be equal to a woman because I don't, you know, that you don't want to carry children or do the dishes, as my friend here says. 
Um, so that, this is God's design. Yeah. I don't want to be equal to a man. Don't put me in war, please. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ask. Sorry. We ask now. Because of God's design, women, who are we? I think we've gotten a little bit lost in that. Where are we? What have we done to you? What has this world done to you? We've witnessed children being stolen, tagged, and sold for a monetary price, exploiting their purity and their innocence like a piece of property. We're being hounded by messages of inadequacy on every screen that they come in contact with. The lies, right? The lies that are slowly killing that natural, I can do anything attitude at a younger and younger age. Kids don't know what they're incapable of. That's the beauty of, of a child, right? It's, it's, it's the greatest thing about them is that they just don't even know what they can't do. I miss that sometimes, you know what I mean? Children can no longer play in their front yards. They can no longer anticipate childhoods of free play and wonder without the threat of predator, be it media or man. Children, who are you? Where are you? What have we done to you? The Lord is calling out to us. Where are you? Just like he called out to Adam. See, our safe channels, even for our children, are we're like Food Network and, and, and Sprout, and those are not even safe anymore. This commercials where people can now just buy a spot. They can purchase it with money and say whatever they want. They can put whatever they want inside of my home as long as they got the right amount of money. And so we've gotten, in my house, just gotten rid of the cable because we just, we can't, we can't control. If I had it my way, I'd move to the forest, right? <laughs> but I wouldn't survive it. <laughs> <laughs> and now, of course, this is an extreme day that we're living in that maybe we never thought we would see. The day when, when male and female is a fluid concept and only determined by the individual's perception of himself or your feelings of that day rather than God's design, right? right? It's a day where I can tell you, um, please don't offend me. Today I feel that the sky is red. And if you tell me that it's blue, I'm really offended that you are challenging my perception of that. So just let me let me decide for myself. You decide for yourself, right? Yeah. What happened to finite truth now? Do we not all have the same truth in front of our faces right. anymore? Right? My truth will be what I want it to be. Your truth will be what you want it to be. And we'll just stay out of each other's way. What a day. What a day we are living in. And don't forget about marriage. The one Probably the first thing that God defined, one of the first things that God defined, only require that two people, whoever these people, just they're just love, and that's all that matters. Hmm? That's all that matters. And I, I, we didn't make these rules. I didn't make these rules. You didn't make these rules. It's just the truth. God created it. He defined it. It, it is what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is. There's no apologies for it. Right? And now we're on this, this defensive place where, where we are being attacked because the creator of everything living and breathing defines such as so, and the truth is being attacked. Marriage, where are you? What have we done to you? And I'm not here to make any political statements or, or anything of the like, but, but aren't you tired, church? Are you tired of the blatant denial of absolute truth? Yes. Just a blatant denial. This is just absolute truth. Yeah. We didn't make these rules, and I don't apologize for them. This is this is the Lord that the God that we serve. The reason that I'm standing here right now today. Amen. Yes. So I'm asking God at this time in my life, make me fearless again, Lord. Make me fearless. Make your church fearless. Make one church fearless, Lord. Make one church, Riverbank, a fearless people. 
a fearless people that would charge forth knowing that the truth is what it is, what it is, what it is, and we don't apologize for it. We stand up for it, and we love those who need to understand it, and they will. It's a time to be fearless. We must know who we are. We must know who we are. Church, we must know who we are. The lies of manipulation, the compromise has not and will not stop. And there will be more confusion thrown at you, at your children, causing us to just question, who are we? What do we stand for? Right? No, there's no demon that's going to make you think something else. No, it's just question, right? Compromise, complacency, yeah. right? Strategy yeah. to just just to just to inch you away yeah. from finite truth. Just to inch right. you away slowly but surely and make you question, well actually just you know, actually that doesn't sound too bad. But does it line up with the word of God? Right. Does it go yeah. by his original definition? Yeah. Right? And I've even found I'm here to admit to you, I've even found myself questioning, you know what? Maybe that's fine. And then feeling the conviction of the Lord saying, no, that is not what I said. That is not what I said. Go back to my original words. Yes. Go back to my original words. So we must be rooted, church. We must be prepared. We must prepare our kids, our children to stand firm. I can't imagine what it's like to be a kid today. I can't even wrap my head around it, what it must be like. We got to know who we are. We got to know who we are. There's no time to weigh. So today I want to submit to you three challenges that pertains to our identity as it is in Christ. Number one, we must know what we are. You must know what you are. What you are. What are you? In Genesis 2.23 it says, I'll call her woman because she was taken out of man. She was the helper to man. She was the one created just right as the Bible says for Adam. She was his partner, so he wouldn't be alone. She was a woman. She wasn't an animal. She wasn't a tree, right? She wasn't another creature of the garden or a body of water. She was made for man. She was woman. That is what she was. In order to obtain a rooted identity, we must know truly what we are. When asked what are you, there, there are several ways you might answer that question. We could identify ourselves by our ethnicity, right? We might could identify ourselves by our profession. We could identify ourselves by our family placement. Each role serving a, a specific set of duties <clears throat> in order to know why we exist, right? Which is the ultimate reason, the ultimate search in life. What are we here for? Believer or unbeliever, that's the one thing everybody wants to know. Why am I here? Why am I here? In order to know that, we must know what we are. <clears throat> you may not realize this, but when we define, identify anything, even ourselves, it's done by using a reference point. What is that? A reference point is, is just a fancy term used in mathematics, science, physics, um, psychology, and so on, and other industries. And it, all it means is one item that is definite, that is certain, that is, that is, is, is it just it is, it always will be, right? It's a non-variable that is used to identify another item. So just to give you an example, it's a point of reference of if you're driving down a long highway and you want to measure roughly how far you, or fast you've driven or how far you are to your destination, you look for a reference point, something that is solid, something that is steadfast something that is sustained and can't be shifted, like a, a big mountain or, or a huge building, right? You don't choose other cars or things that are fleeting or driving by you which way because they offer no certainty. They give you nothing to measure your own journey by. In other words, you seek something whose greatness, whose permanence will speak back to you and tell you what you are. You are five miles out. You are moving quickly. You are losing daylight. You are making good time. Something that will give you a solid answer, that will give you confidence on the journey that is ahead. Amen? See, our biggest problem today is that we've shifted our reference point from God 
The only thing that is certain, the only thing that is that is that is that it is that it is that it is that will never change, the only non-variable in our life, the only non-variable in our life, the only non-variable in your in our life, right? The one and only thing that will never change. That will never change. That will never change. I love you and I know you love your spouse, but guess what? They will change. They are not a certain thing. I hate to say that, you know, because it sounds like, oh, you're doomed. No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. He is the one and only thing that will never change in season and out, up and down, high and low, good time, bad time, happy time, sad time. He is the only thing that will never change. He has been and he always will be. And then he always will be. He is the one thing you can put all your money on. You can count on him anytime. He will never let you down. The biggest problem is that we've shifted our point of reference from the one and only thing that cannot change onto ourselves, onto our feelings, onto our circumstances, onto other people, right? And we're using other things to measure our life by, to define ourselves by, and we're coming up short. And we don't understand why. We don't understand why. What happened to our identity? Well, let me tell you something. You're using a really bad measuring stick. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we are fleeting creatures. We are fallible. We are momentary. We are like the Bible says, a vapor in the wind. And our feelings are even more so, right? So today we've encountered a time where, where we use all sorts of different things to define us and, and, and to tell us what we are. Um, for example, social media as a reference point. Yeah. Tell me what I am. You know, Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Tell me what I am. Am I beautiful? Am I likable? Right? There, I work in, in, in communications, in the communications industry, and, and I've learned that young kids now will post a picture online on their account, and they will find out how many likes they get. And if they don't get enough likes, whatever that number is, they'll remove the picture down. They'll take it down. Like it didn't get enough likes, I gotta take it down because it's embarrassing. Okay, so or they'll they'll post up a picture and you know do all the, the special posing and, and you know make sure you, that looks skinny and all this kind of stuff and then post it, save it for a certain time of day or a certain day of the week in order to achieve the most likes and the most affirmation from it, the most false affirmation. So they use this device or this this program as a reference point. They're finding value in it. They're measuring themselves in it. Right? I see some kids laughing in the back. Mm -hmm. Celebrity as a reference point. Tell me what I am. Am I successful when I get that kind of car? Then I'll be successful. Then I'll be likable. Then I'll be such and such and such, right? I mean, we look at what they do as a comparison. Okay, well, I'm this, I'm in this class, I'm not in the upper class yet, but when I get A, B, C, D, like so-and-so, then, you know, then I'll be considered a qualified person. Feelings is a reference point. Tell me what I am, am I, am I happy, am I sad? Am I, am I a great person, am I a sad person? What am I, am I a boy, am I a girl, am I, Okay, straight, LGBTQ, RST, B, W, X, Y, Z. Am I worthy? Am I alive? Right? Feelings. Feelings to define what we are. See, if you're this person walking around today without the purpose, it's because you've been unable to identify what you are, what your function is, where you belong. And I must tell you today that it, it will get better. It will get better. It will get better. So listen, there's a war over your soul. The enemy is, is losing time, losing ground, right? And if you could, because he, he knows the destination. He knows the end of the story, right? Right? He knows the end of it. So he's got to do everything he can to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, and war. So he's warring over us. He's warring over, over, over us. And if you could just for one moment step back outside of, 
of your circumstances and look at the big picture, you'd see that the distraction and the confusion is, is so strategic, it's purposeful. He wants to destroy your identity. That was his plan at the very, very, very beginning, and it's his plan today. Now, so are we alert? Are we on guard? Are we ready? Are we paying attention? Are we seeing it happen before our eyes, or are we just letting it happen to us? Because it's so, it's so just passe. Oh, well, I didn't even notice. Well, you better wake up and start taking notice because as every generation awakens itself, he comes up with new plans, right? Mm -hmm. So he wants you to forget who you are, or what you are, rather. He wants to destroy your identity because then you'll forget that in John 1, 2, you're a child of God. And in Romans 8, 17, you're an heir of God's glory. In Romans 5, 11, you're a friend of God. Wow. Wow, you're a friend of God. Man, I used to love that psalm that Israel heard that I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, and I would weep. I would weep because I'm like, why he calls me friend? If you've ever known anyone that has a celebrity fan, oh, they're dropping that name all the time, right? <laughs> oh, guess what? I know so-and-so. I was with, you know, I was with so-and-so last week and had a coffee shoot in the breeze. They make, they make, they take every opportunity to drop that name, right? <clears throat> if you've known anybody with a little bit of clout, right, or a little bit of celebrity, it's like, oh yeah, you know what I mean? Me in Sacramento, I go around telling people I know Tracy Traub. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, I can get you a meetup. Ooh, I, tell, I tell everybody, right? A friend of God. He calls you his friend. Friend. Yes. He calls you and me his friend. Yes. You consider me a friend? I would weep yes. every time. And I will tell you, oh, Mitty, it was a lonely time in my life. And I just remember you you call me friend? You consider me a friend? He's dropping your name. Yeah. Let that sink in for a second. You want to talk about name dropping? He's dropping your name. You call me your friend? Man, I could call the worship team up right Ooh, now, right? right? Yeah. Man, you call me your friend? He called, the enemy wants you to forget that you are a friend of God. You're a friend of God. Galatians 3.13, you are redeemed by God. First John 4.10, you are loved by God. Psalm 50.10, you are wealthy in God. Guess what? He's, he calls you wealthy. Your father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. You're wealthy in him. Don't look at your checkbook as a reference point. Don't look at your bank account as a reference point or 401k. Don't look at this stuff as a, as a point of reference. Look to the provider. Look to the guy that owns the cattle of a thousand hills. The same guy that calls you friend, that calls you this child, that says, I love you. You are wealthy. Philippians 4.13, you are invincible in Christ. Yes. That means nothing can come against you. Nothing can stop you. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. This mm -hmm. truth right here, this promise is why he is warring over our soul. He doesn't want us to know this. See, some of y'all have been hanging out in the wilderness so long, you don't even realize when you're standing in the promised land. They say when people have been in prison for so long that they get institutionalized, that when they come out into the regular world that they can't get along well, they can't succeed, they can't do well because they, they are so imprisoned still in their mind that they've been institutionalized. See, some of us have been institutionalized by our circumstances. We've been living in slavery for so long and living in defeat for so long that when he's freed us, when he's called us redeemed, we don't even receive the blessings. We still live like a slave. Institutionalized by your circumstances. See, when his word, his greatness, his omnipotence becomes our point of reference, it is so easy to identify what you are. Amen? Number two, we must know who you are. Know who you are. Look at this. There's a certain... There is a, such a super valuable lesson we can learn here in the story of Adam and Eve. And we look at chapter two, God gives, God gives Adam, the woman, right, his help, 
helper. By this time of the story, he's named all the creatures in the garden by God's authority. That was his command to Adam. Go and name everything. What an honor, right? Yep. You get to give everything its name. So all the birds, red birds, that's what it was, now all have names. Hey, you're a parrot, you're a pigeon, you're a dog, you're this, you're that, right? All the bears have names. He goes through the garden. You're a black bear, you're a panda bear, you're a koala bear, you're a polar bear. Right? He goes, all the reptiles have names. You're an iguana, you're a tree frog, you're a crocodile, you're a lizard, you're this, right? He gives everything a name. He knows what they are, and then he gives them names. Even all the grossest animals have names. Mouse, fly, mosquito, <laughs> someone said spider last time. I would challenge a cat, maybe. <laughs> Dog person, so, you know what I mean? So he gives everything a name. Sorry if you like cats, I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. He wants to leave me out. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> the only one who didn't have a name was the woman. The only one who didn't have a name was the woman. We know what she was. She's a woman. We don't even know who she is. It is until after the eternal sin is committed that he names her. The act that would shift life for all of humanity to the end of time. It wasn't until after God's judgment was passed on Adam that he names the woman. In Genesis 3, 13, it says, Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Remember, because you have done this, you are cursed, cursed, curses, 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 curses for the rest of your whole existence until Jesus comes back, right? He didn't say that, but we'll just paraphrase there. And then in verse 20, then, the verse 20, then, the very first word, oh, then, oh, then, huh? Then the man, Adam, just to give you, just to remind you who he is, right? Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. You see, Adam's mistake was not merely biting the apple after his wife or losing track of her whereabouts. Oh, where'd that woman go? You know what I mean? Like you lose her in a store, you can't find her anywhere, and then you're just sitting down by the way, you know, by the dressing room waiting for her to come back. That wasn't his mistake. Then you think Adam's mistake was not loving her enough, so she was deceived because she just wasn't happy at home, so she went out looking for food, right? Or maybe you think his mistake was he didn't provide for her. She was hungry, so she got deceived because her stomach was growling. You know, that can happen when you get hangry. Sometimes you're hungry and angry at the same time, right? So maybe we think that was her mistake, or that was his mistake, um, you know, and she, was, she became a wayward woman. No, his mistake was not naming her. He didn't name her when the Lord said, name everything. When I read this passage, I thought, Adam, what are you thinking? You've been handpicked, given all authority and power directly from God to name all things. The power you have to give identity, to give vision, to share authority, to release value and meaning over the most important creature God created for you, and you withheld it. You withheld it. What if he had told her from the beginning? What if he had given her her name? What if he had said, your name is Eve? Eve originates in the Hebrew, and it means to breathe, to live, or to give life. What if he had said, your name is Eve? You are the life giver. You are the doorway to humanity. You are the gatekeeper of all who will exist. Through you, life will burst forth. You will bring life to everything that has breath and will worship the Creator. Amen? Yeah. What if He had designated her identity? What if He had given her name? What if He had told her who she was? What if He had told her who she was? Would the enemy have been able to deceive her? I'd say no. Listen, when you know who you are, you cannot be deceived. Right. You cannot be deceived. Right. No politician, no lawmaker, no fleeting emotion, no false prophet can deceive you. No 
No one can deceive you. Your Instagram can deceive you. Your checkbook can deceive you. Your boss can deceive you. Your spouse can deceive you. Your children can deceive you. Your, your, your frenemies can deceive you. No one can deceive you. I guarantee you the story would have went different. And I imagine in my mind that it went something like this. Genesis 3, the serpent replied, you won't die, the, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And in my version, right, Eve replies, Satan, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Do you know what my name is? I am Eve. I am the life giver. God has ordained me, created me, defined me, designed me to give life. How then can I bring forth life if God has left me lacking something? You're telling me that I need something there, and I'm telling you that no, I don't. He has equipped me. He has set me apart for his purpose. I have all that I need to perform the purpose that God has created me for. You cannot lie to me. You cannot deceive me. My maker has a task for me. I am prepared. I am fully equipped. I am positioned, poised, and prepared for the task at hand. Eat your own fruit, enemy, and flee from this place. What if he had told her her name? But God has a name for you. See, Eve, she lacked identity. She lacked a name. You know, you, you have to know the importance of a name, right? The name is so important. It's everything. It defines us. It carries our purpose. It carries our reputation. Once a name is tainted, it's difficult to recover a name. Right? How many of you are, are saving up to purchase a Ford Pinto at any time? No. <laughs> <laughs> the name, the name. Right? Or, or, or how about corn sugar, which is just high fructose corn syrup, renamed to scare you less. Right? Because a name is so important. A name is so important. It constitutes value. Names were so important to God that he would change someone's name when he reset them on a new path. Saul was changed to Paul, Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Hadassah to Esther. When he changed their name, he changed their path, he changed their destination. He said, everything that was is no longer. All your sins have been forgiven. All that old person is dead. She is dead and gone. He is no longer. He is cast away. We don't remember him. He is dead. And this is who you are. Go forth in this path, in this direction, and I will redefine you. I will give you a new name, and I will give you a new life, and I will give you a new destination. I will redefine you. I will wipe away that old reputation. I will wipe away the sins of your childhood, of your past. I will make them forgotten, never to be remembered again. And just in case anybody remembers them, I'm going to read identify you. I'm going to give you a new ID card so you can say, no, that's not me. Check it out. This is who I am. I am new in Christ. I am new in Christ. Oh, man, is that just like our salvation? The day you gave your heart to him, he said, you were that person no longer. Let me change your name, my son, my daughter. Let me give you a new identity. Let me tell you that you are saved. You are redeemed. You are free. You are alive. You are alive. Everybody influences someone. 
What kind of influence are you? What kind of influence are you? And finally, I'm gonna invite the worship team to, all to help me. Once you know what you are, then you know who you are, right? I submit that you must know whose you are, whose you are, who you belong to. See, one of the most heartbreaking passages in the Bible to me is Genesis 3, 6, and it says the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and that its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and suddenly, they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. The Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Yes. Where are you? This is the very first question he asked the man. Every time I read this passage, a part of me just breaks on the inside. And I just imagine God walking into the garden just like he did every other day, regularly, to have communion with Adam, to walk with him, to be with him, to hang with him, to share time with him, right? To be one with him, to share company, to share life with him, to breathe on him. Where are you, Adam? God knew where they were. Why is he asking this? He's saying, Adam, He has no idea that he can't walk on water. He has no idea that he can't fly. 
Thank you.